Ten years in the making. 546 days of continuous sport condensed into three weeks. We had nine million spectators. We had 17,000 athletes, 20,000 media, and 4.3 billion TV viewers, and a price tag of 8.7 billion pounds. And most importantly, one deadline, one date, the 27th of July, 2012, that was completely immovable. I'm going to try and share with you this, my experience of that. And critically, for me, the role that collaboration played in delivering London's games and the role that design collaboration truly paid, uh, played in, in, delivering, in delivering those games. I started my Olympic career in 2006. I was brought on board as an architect to look at the built environment, the buildings that would make the games, the master plan. And it was a journey that would take me over that six, six and a half year period to understand the role that I play as an architect, but the role that design could actually play in shaping the places that we create collectively. So the image you see here was an image that the world got very accustomed to in the summer of 2012. And for this very brief moment, for six weeks, this place was the most photographed place on Earth. The world instantly recognized that this was London, it was new, it was the games. Now, the bid that we inherited said that we were going to create the most sustainable Olympics ever. Now, as design principle, that's a bit of a big challenge to take on, the most sustainable Olympics. How can an event which brings nine million spectators to one city for three weeks ever be sustainable? We asked ourselves that question many times. And it was actually by looking back at what we were trying to do. So we looked at why we were doing it rather than what we were trying to achieve that we could start to unlock those goals. And when we looked at why, we understood that what we were looking to do is, yes, we were hosting the Olympics and the Paralympics, but what we were actually doing was we were looking to inspire a generation, and also we were looking to la leave a lasting legacy, a legacy both in terms of physical terms, but also in the hearts and memories of everyone who would witness this event in the summer of 2012. Now, I was very fortunate, inherited an incredible winning bid just by one vote, but it's a winning bid. Um, and that bid promised to inspire a generation. It promised to give us sustainable games. But the key that it unlocked for us as well is that, that it promised to put London and the UK as center stage. So rather than creating a massive, overblown, global TV event, what we were going to do, we were going to take the assets that we had, the city, the country, and actually celebrate them and then bring the Olympics into that, rather than the other way around. So here you see a shot of Buckingham Palace with the cyclists whizzing by. That was a real core part of what would the games would be for us, about celebrating the city and celebrating our place. Now throughout, design was always at the forefront of our thinking. And design in the broader sense. My role as design principal shifted from architecture to then being having to consider architecture, graphics, the look of the games, art, landscape. And, and when you take on a project such as this, it forces you to really reconsider what are your preconceived ideas about what makes good design. With that in mind, we set out to be the first organizing committee for any summer games to deliver a design strategy. Now, it's the kind of thing that ordinarily in practice, as architects and designers, we often do. You write the brief. It's pretty straightforward. But when you've got something of this complexity, we had to try and readdress what we were doing, as I said, and, and develop a design strategy that would reflect both what we physically needed to do, but also what we emotionally needed to do as well. 
bringing it back from global, bringing it down to the local. So if you came to the games, if you were part of it, it was personal. It was your experience, one that was a shared experience. Now, we put the athletes front and center. We tried to put them in venues which are iconic, venues which, which celebrated the whole Olympian effort. Um, and it's down to those athletes that much of our success in 2012 was truly realized. Now, when we approached a design strategy, if you look at the complexity of putting on an Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, it is the most just massive event. Um, it's the biggest peacetime logistical event that any nation puts on. When we looked at a strategy for delivering that, we knew that we had to get simple. If we were to create some overblown, wordy, verbose design strategy that we'd expected everyone to pick up, we'd lose the battle. So we got simple. And so the image that you see behind us at the moment reflects that kind of design strategy. Now, 8.7 billion pounds, that's a lot of money. And you'd expect us to be able to, to build you know, a fine piece of handmade Italian furniture for 8.7 billion pounds. But that was not what we were about. We were much more about the deck chair. The deck chair, it was flexible, it was, it was adaptable, it responded to its environment. It was about bringing people together. It wasn't about, I'm exclusive, I'm on my own. It was a collective. It was also sustainable. How do you do a sustainable games? One, you leave a lasting legacy. But first and foremost, you challenge the brief. You ask, do we really need to do that? And you build less. And so when we took that forward, that applied to everything that we did. Always doing it appropriately and always attempting to do that with this kind of image of our favorite little deck chair in our minds. And of course, these athletes were front and center, and we got everything in line for them. But we also knew one major factor. As technology moved forward, we could no longer depend on the fact that our games was going to be measured by the TV, by the broadcasters, by the media. In fact, our games was going to be measured by one really, really important group of people. These people, the spectators. We were entered into an age where we could not just rest on our laurels about saying, it looked great on TV, didn't it? We loved it. Look at that image. These people were going to measure us. It was going to be by their handhelds. It was going to be through social media. And that's exactly what happened. So we started on a journey six years hence, and looking at where we got to and looking at the way we could adapt all down to the way in which we approach design, flexibility, but fundamentally bringing it for people. And once we got that right, we knew that we were on the right track. And it was that approach which we applied to a temporary event, which then gave us the same golden thread through all of the things that we would do, from the games themselves to the legacy, to Olympic Park, and to the, to the uh, Stratford City moving forward. We had an opportunity to create venues which were incredible. Here we see Horse Guards Parade, a 15,000-seat beach volleyball arena built in essentially in the back garden of the Prime Minister. And this kind of venue really reflects the kind of effort that goes behind delivering the games. This venue, we only had six weeks to build it. So six weeks to build a 15,000-seat arena which would only last three weeks. It took six years to get to the position where we could start that build process. Now, an example of how do you make a simple design strategy. Here we see a horseshoe. And I put it up there, yes, we did have some horse events and there, are, there is relevance. But actually, this, uh, this, this image here really reflected some of one of the key strategies which I think translates into what's it mean to do something simple and really direct. We looked at the arenas that we needed to build. 34 different competitions, sport competitions, were going to take place in London during those games. Ordinarily, when you create a, a sports venue, you, you, you create it focused on the sport. So it's almost like me on the red spot now. It's all, you focus on that center point. You create a bowl, you enclose it, it's inward looking. Now we could have done that, but actually we thought, well, if we do an inward looking bowl, we're then going to have to dress it with more and more color to make sure that people go, oh, that's London, isn't it? Well, we thought, 
why don't we open it up? Why don't we peel it open so that actually rather than creating this four-sided bowl, that fourth elevation, rather than being a wall of, and there'll be beautiful faces and they'll be cheering, but rather than being our spectators, why don't we make it open so that actually that fourth elevation becomes the city, becomes the context. Now as a designer, you often look at precedents, and not all precedents are often relevant to what you think they are, and this was our precedent. It was a baseball stadium, and lots of my colleagues were like, Kevin, that's a baseball stadium, we're doing the uh, Olympics in London, and that's uh, no, not really relevant, is it? Surely. But this stadium in Pittsburgh put the city for the fourth elevation. So then when we looked at one of our baseball stadia, here we have Greenwich Park. Greenwich Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, Sir Christopher Wren, Inigo Jones. I mean, we had some pretty good architects working on the Olympics, but when we looked at, you know, well, sorry guys, but you've got plastic seats, a bit of stick, some scaffold pipe, and some, uh, some colored, uh, colored banners, um, it's pretty tough to compete with Sir Christopher Wren. Um, so what we said is actually, don't compete, let's actually complement. So when we looked at it, let's do that third elevation. So here is a computer generated image of our interpretation of Greenwich Park. 27,000 seat equestrian arena, the fourth elevation was the Inigo Jones Queen's House, 16th century architecture. Now this is the computer generated image. What was most satisfying is then when we went to this image, which was the real thing. And actually what this also showed is, it's also my favorite seat, by the way, in the entire Olympic Games. Um, row 35 on the South Stand in Greenwich. <laughs> now, more often than not, the back row, now apologies on the back row, the back row is often the cheap seats. Um, and actually, back rows are often the most expensive seats to build because of the height and the elevation rest fit. So really what we said here is, let's bring some extra value. And those seats, that's a view that you will never, ever get again. So those people who witnessed those seats, congratulations, you've experienced something very special. That encapsulated what we were about. Now, at this stage as well, it's really easy to say, you know, collaboration, collaborative design, straightforward, lovely process, everyone comes as a group hug. We had to build it from the ground up. So it's collaborative clients. So the games were delivered by two organizations, the Olympic Delivery Authority and LOCOG, the London Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. Those two bodies came together. We collaborated. We had a very small group of like-minded people who shared a vision, and we shared it collectively between organizations. That was then shared between, with politicians, our local stakeholders, our sports authorities, the, the Olympics themselves. We then were able to translate that directly to our designers and our architects and the like because actually by believing in ourselves, we could then translate that directly. You know, it was a case of do what we do. Don't just, you know, just, we had to practice it ourselves. We couldn't just enforce it on others. And also, when it came to that, here we see an image of the velodrome. The velodrome is a really good, great casing point, because often when we look at uh, the design of these venues, the games, quite rightly, uh, were focused on the fact that we delivered venues on time and on budget. And let's not forget, it was delivered during a massive economic downturn. Now, with this, we looked at trying to reinterpret what that means. Value engineering is something that I come across every day as, as, as an architect running a practice. Value engineering is something which is often perceived as a reductive exercise. Something that means you've got something great, I'm sorry, you're going to have to just downgrade it a bit and make it cheaper. I think what this showed is actually by having the right message with your client and the right message with the designers, we could actually, believe it or not, bring value through value engineering. So any engineer would always want to say, well, engineering is you know, more. This is what we tried to do. And so bringing that forward then created the kind of iconic venues which would deliver the games. Over 4,000 architects were involved. Now, I can go through all of the different disciplines, but 4,000 designers involved in, in delivering the games. And I think the one thing that really resonated for all of us as part of that games was this atmosphere that was created. It truly was a collaborative piece. The fact that it was almost like being back in college. There was a moment where ideas were shared openly between companies because they were given that protective, bracket, that, that protective blanket to say, look, we can do this. We can collectively share these ideas, be confident, put them out there, and actually we can do this together. And it was only by doing it together that these games really delivered 
all aspirations. Now, I'm often, uh, I often joke about the fact that I started the games thinking I was going in as an architect, and by the time I finished, I think I came out as a politician. Um, but what it reminded me of is, as, as a design education, is an incredible tool and something I forgot. And it was only by going back into this kind of world that I realized the tools that we are taught in college, in university. And it's something that really, really resonates with me, design education. Because design education sets you up with the tools not just to focus on what you're delivering on the final piece, but it talks about process and it talks about sharing ideas. And, and in many ways, reinforcing the fact that when you take on a big project, it's too complex for one person. And sometimes it's too complex for a small team. It's a shared process. Design education for me, and it was actually my first year tutor um, at uh, Yale who said to me, look, if you're gonna do big projects, you almost need to be like a newspaper editor. A newspaper editor understands all of the different segments of his publication, but he's not an expert in sport. He's not an expert in finance or horoscopes. But he's put the right people in place he understands their roles, and he sits there, supports, and then brings them collectively together to one goal. The role of design in a project like this is all about that. And I quickly understood that actually it was not about being measured by success about what you create with your pen or your computer, but equally how much you, you, you basically can share your ideas, communicate, inspire others to then carry that message forward. Now, when we embarked on our journey, we looked at legacy. We talked about legacy a lot. And legacy is often about the physical. And it was only by going through the kind of process we went through, we started to really understand that actually there's another legacy. There's a legacy of memory. And I think the kind of images that were created for, for London in 2012 resonate with that memory in the hearts and minds of people who witnessed on TV, but critically who were there, who saw it. And that's the kind of intangible. It's very difficult when you go starting a being, being a project to understand what that means. But I think as we came out, we understood that memory was massive. And I think we started to achieve by leaving that lasting memory of six weeks. Now, the role of design is often listed, uh, uh, basically perceived as, as an individual piece. You know, you get the star architecture and the, I want a named piece. I think what we showed in the games is that you can actually deliver great design. And you can deliver great design with great names. But actually, critically, design is not an individual pursuit. It is all about delivering as a team. Thank you.